Andrea thought it would be fun to do a little video on all things home birthing and baby number four and our relationship. So I put up a question on my Instagram stories for people to ask their questions and let's get right into it. Sounds good. Okay, the first one is when is your due date? I actually do on my birthday, which is May 13th, so middle of May. What natural birthing prep do you do? I'm having my first in July and I want to do a water birth. Your midwife will give you a list of home birthing supplies for you to get ready and have on hand before the birth. And your midwife will bring all the other essential supplies for a safe and healthy home birth. Be sure to discuss with your midwife that you want to have a home water birth and what the options are there. Sometimes a midwife will already have a birthing tub on hand and all you have to do is buy the liner and other times you'll need to get your own birthing tub if that is the case. It just depends on your midwife and your situation and where you live and all that. Some people think, why can't I just give birth in my bathtub? Mm, yeah. And I guess you could, but the, the difference with a birthing tub is it's, it's like really big, it's soft around the edges, so if the when the midwife needs to lean in or the husband wants to lean in, it's much more comfortable as opposed to like a ceramic tub, mm -hmm. which is hard. And when you're in labor or pushing, it's probably the yeah. soft birthing tub has more give to it. It's more comfortable. You can move around more. Now you might have a really big tub at home that you're comfortable in, then that would work. But for most people, like the standard regular shower tub probably isn't big enough. Yeah, it's kind of uncomfortable. At one point with my first birth, I got into our regular tub before the birthing tub was set up and I felt just like a beached whale in a box that was really hard to move around and get comfortable. It was just really hard to get comfortable, but in the actual birthing tub, it's a really good point. It's way more comfortable. It's wider, easier space for you to get on all fours and move around. Having an actual birthing tub is really helpful. But the other thing I was going to say that's really helpful to prep for your home birth is to read Orgasmic Birth or listen to it on Audible. It is such a great book to listen to or read before you give birth, specifically to read it closer towards the end of your pregnancy so that it's really fresh in your mind before you give birth. It's super inspiring and I just found it really helpful with my last birth. I read it before I gave birth to Scout. And then other things to have and prepare before your birth that I really like and a lot of women really like to do is to have like a labor music playlist and just to pick your favorite like really relaxing, uplifting, soothing type of music that you really enjoy and just have that all set up before you're close to even going into labor. And then also having things like a salt rock lamp or candles just to set the mood because you're likely going to want dim lighting. It's pretty natural and normal to not want stark bright lights, which is often what a hospital room is like, but at home you can set the lighting to your desires. And yeah, that's just, those are two. Oh, and essential oils too. Okay, should we go to the next one? Yes. Andrew, how was the first birth for you? Was it a shock also because of the pain and maybe blood? Well, I know it was a shock for Ellen, but yeah, it was, it was a shock for me too, to see her in that much discomfort. I think the main shock was when Elvis came out. That was a shock like uh, I never experienced before. But overall, I, I wouldn't use the word shock. I would compare it more to joy or extreme happiness more than shock. I kind of think of shock as like, you're numb and you can't feel what's going on, but I definitely had lots of emotion. It was tons and tons of joy. How do you handle the comparison game of who does more, who's more tired, etc.? I thought that was an interesting question. Who does question. more what? Like, the comparison game as if you're arguing like, well, I'm doing more work in the house, or I take care of the kids more, or I do more work, or whatever. Trying to compare how much each person does is never going to get you very far. Yeah, never. Instead, it would be so. it's so much more helpful to focus on the positives of what your partner is doing and being thankful for that. I often like daily think like, wow, I can't even imagine if I was doing this all by myself. Like I'm so thankful for everything that he does. But how do you, I mean, sometimes do you think it could be easy to just start comparing and be like, oh, I work, I have to do all this all day and she's just sitting on her butt all day. Yeah, it's very easy to compare. <laughs> it's generally uh, when you're not feeling your best, you start comparing. Yeah. But if, if both parties are doing as much as they can, then you're both probably going to feel pretty adequate because if I'm doing you know everything I can to help and she's doing everything she can to help then there would be no reason to feel like to compare because everything's going to be getting done and then like right when the baby's born like Ellen has to rest for a few weeks you can't really be on her feet much or the few weeks before the baby's born as well so automatically I just know I'm going to have to do more in those periods yeah. and then right after the baby comes I know Ellen knows She's going to be handling the baby more because the baby's learning to nurse 
and she, the baby is just a little more attached to mom in those first few months. My job is take care of the other kids more and do more around the house while she's resting and connecting with the baby. I try to put myself in her shoes. Like if I had just had a, a major surgery or something and I was recovering and I needed you know a week or two to rest, I'm not gonna be able to do everything on my own and I'm gonna need to rely on her. And that's kind of her situation. After you give birth, you know, the mom needs to rest for multiple weeks. She shouldn't really be on her feet much. Yeah, the first like four weeks, every time the midwife is normally like, don't get up unless you're going to the bathroom. Let your partner get you water. Let your partner get you everything that you need. And he makes my food for the first like few weeks straight to work so I don't have to be standing on my feet because it's so important to yeah. rest. You'll heal so much faster yeah. if, you, if you rest. Yeah, and often, obviously this is not a topic to the question, but often like mothers will try to be this superhero if you will like i can just get up and start going to the beach and i can just start going on hikes and stuff when i'm one week postpartum and that is so not necessary like you're already amazing for what you just did and you need to take that time to rest you'll heal quicker you'll stop bleeding quicker it's just so much so much better so that kind of went on a tangent but really that could be a whole video in and of itself okay how do you think you'll handle labor this time around I'm really optimistic, especially with my last labor with Scout. It was just totally a transformative experience for me, totally different than my first two labors. I loved all three of my home births, but this third one was just exactly what I wanted. And I feel like this time around, I just feel really confident and powerful within my own body to give birth in a way that I desire. And I'm, yeah, I'm excited. Are you going to be able to have a home birth with the new COVID-19 rules? Yes. There's no nothing in the rules that say you can't have a home birth. Yeah, if anything, now is a great time to do a home birth if you're uh, low risk. I know our midwife's gotten way more calls about potential uh, moms that want to give birth at home. My sister-in-law is a midwife in California has gotten way more calls. If anything, this is the time to look into it if you're curious about it. Is it for everybody? No, but if you're low risk, you have a healthcare practitioner that says it's safe for you, then now is probably the time to, if you want to try to avoid being in a hospital, and I know a lot of hospitals are doing rules where the, the partner will be able to be in the delivery room, which yeah, that's crazy. I'd be very sad if I couldn't be there. So be I'm very so grateful for uh, yeah. midwives and home births. Always been a fan of home birth, obviously, but yeah, even more so now. So yeah, if you're interested, you know, midwives are booking up fast because of this. So if you're pregnant, reach out to a midwife sooner than later because they can only take a certain amount of clients per month. Yeah, you don't want to miss out. How are you dealing with the anxiety of giving birth during a pandemic? I actually don't feel anxiety about it. I feel very safe and thankful for my professional midwives overall. And I feel like now more than ever is a great time to have a home birth. Do you think much will change with baby number four? Yes, anytime you add another baby into the mix adds another dynamic, but at the same time, nothing compares to that going from zero kids to one kid feeling and living your life without having to care for someone else that all of a sudden, bam, being handed a baby. E each of our kids, two, three, and now four, I don't think will compare to that shock. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but yeah, I'm expecting have to do more. <laughs> I'm especially expecting this one to be harder. Just with four, it just feels like a total handful, but, and especially working a lot from home and homeschooling. <laughs> That being said, we finally hired an assistant a month ago, and wow, I'm so glad that I did. She's exactly what I needed. She's been so helpful, just being able to do a little bit of part-time help with me. And so I think that's going to be very helpful, especially when I give birth to this next one, to have some help with my work in the transition of having four children and healing from birth. Do you have a backup birth plan for birthing complications? Yes, we have a, a local hospital, great teams of doctors there. Fortunately, our island has not been affected very badly by the coronavirus. The hospitals are open and plenty of space. That being said, we don't want to have to go to the hospital, but that is our emergency plan. And we trust our midwives and their team. They have a lot of the supplies that a hospital has, oxygen, they're able to do an IV, they're able to do stitches, help with some of the more minor things. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that professional midwives are trained to handle a lot of complications that may arise. And we totally trust our birth team to be able to handle if something comes up to where we would need to be transferred to the hospital. And we have many conversations with each pregnancy with our midwives on what the plan would be if different situations arose, even though they are very rare and not very common when you're a low-risk healthy pregnancy. But they can happen, so being prepared is, is very important. Will all the kids be with you guys while you're in labor? Yeah, I'm so 
thankful that I've been able to have my children there for my births. Elvis got to watch Sandy be born, and Elvis and Sandy got to watch Scout be born. So this time around, I asked Elvis and Sandy, would you guys like to see this next baby be born too? And they were like, for sure, please wake us up. We're totally on board. We totally want to see it again. And when it comes to Scout, I think it's actually really helpful for a little toddler to be able to see their mother giving birth to their new baby because especially when they're so little it's hard for them to understand when their parents come home with a new baby out of nowhere it's hard for them to really understand that it was a baby in mom's belly and now this baby is here that we have to all welcome into our family sometimes that adjustment can be really hard for little toddlers but one way to help smooth that transition is when a toddler that's quite young gets to see the baby be born because they get to see that full transition of everybody welcoming the baby into the family, how the baby cam comes into the world, and it's just a lot more clear and easy for them to understand. Yeah, I'm just really thankful that my kids have been able to see their younger siblings be born, and they all love it, so it's really special. Yeah, and we're both very excited to see Scout's reaction. Probably oh the most of anybody. Oh my she's gosh. So she's so excited. She's so excited. <laughs> she's just like always talking about the baby every day. Like, baby, come out soon. I'm going to hold the baby. And then she like pretends like she's what she's going to do when she holds the baby. It's so sweet. Yeah, I'm really excited. Oh, one thing, maybe in the question you didn't say, the kids normally aren't there while she's in labor. Mm. Normally during yeah. the delivery. So when she starts pushing, the kids will come in the room. So we have a plan. Yes. Generally, if it's during the day that we have our neighbors who are going to watch the kids so Ellen can be at home and not have any distractions and then obviously if it's at night they'll be asleep and then we can wake them up. Yeah, totally. Because it's really helpful to not have like too many people in your space when you're going through labor. Um, yeah, it's just really helpful. Why did you have home birth for all your births? What are the benefits in your eyes? Wow, there's so many benefits in my eyes. The thing that got me started on home birthing was we watched this documentary called Business of Being Born. This was when I was pregnant with my first child, Elvis, a long time ago, so nine years ago. It totally blew us away, so we started digging in and doing some research. We were reading different books on the subject and just learning about how low-risk pregnancies um, can actually be safer at home when there's less interventions. When you have a licensed professional team and well-experienced team there to be with you during your birth. And and that just got me so excited because the idea of having such an important experience, probably one of the most important experiences I'll have in my life, to be in the safety and comfort of my own home just sounded so much more wonderful than being at a hospital where um, largely you're not as in charge and don't have as much control over the settings and environment of what you'd like your birth to be. Also, there's just so many factors, like being hooked up to IVs. Many hospitals, you have to stay in the hospital bed. This is not all of them across the country or across the world, obviously, but a lot of them. Um, there's a lot of rules to where only certain people can be in the hospital, like maybe only one partner, or maybe, or maybe you can have a doula, but you can't have kids. There's like certain states where you can't have kids when you're in labor, and that was really important to me for my kids to be able to be there while I gave birth and just the dim lighting factor, the comfort factor, there's just so many reasons. What else am I missing? I feel like there's uh, there's Probably. so many reasons, but that's just on the top of my head of what just really inspired us to have a home birth. And after having the home birth, I felt so empowered and thankful for the experience. I can't imagine it any other way. And that being said, you know, my friends who have had high-risk pregnancies, of course they're thankful for the hospital experience, and I would be too if I had a high-risk pregnancy. But that's just not how it's been for me for any of my pregnancies. So yeah, so just I feel safest at home personally, but everybody should give birth where they feel safest. Ultimately, if you feel safer at a hospital, that's where you should give birth. Did you always plan to have four or more kids? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, we always said like three or four was our plan. We never really had a plan. I always, my plan was one at a time. We, we kind of talked about like, well, I could picture having up to four, or, but it was never like, we're going to have three, we're going to have four. Yeah, like kind of, let's just go one at a time, see how it goes. I think after three, we were both kind of thinking that was probably... Yeah, we even talked idea. about it in a previous video where we were like, I think we're done, but like maybe. And I didn't really want to say we were for sure done because mm -hmm. I think subconsciously a part of me did want to have another one. But yeah, I feel like we're on the same page. Like we're done after this one. That's the plan. Yeah, yeah we're on the same page. <laughs> <Plan. right? laughs> okay, do you usually deliver early, on time, or late? With Elvis, um, I was a week early. And then with Sandy and Scout, they were born on their guest dates. So I'm quite around the right on time section. Who gets to call the baby sex this time, you or Andrew? I thought this was an interesting question because every single time we 
do not plan that at all. We actually forget to check whether the baby's a boy or a girl every single time, even the third time was, it took a while before we decided. I didn't forget. I was thinking about it the whole time. Really? <laughs> you never told me that. I forgot because I'm just in that heat of the moment where I'm just so happy that labor's over and that I have my baby in my arms and I'm just so happy about that and every single time someone has to say, do you want to check if it's a boy or a girl? And I'm like, oh wait, what? Oh yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, it's pretty much, I mean, we just kind of both will check at the same time. Okay, do you have a list of names? And someone else said, um, did you agree on a name this time? You want to share your perspective on that? I have my perspective. <laughs> I, with this baby, I haven't been very concerned with the names, to be honest. The other ones, I was had more strong opinions, and we talked about it almost daily. Oh, Where, come on, not that much. Yeah, we talked about, like, Elvis and Sandy yeah. and Scott. Like, we talked about it pretty frequently. With this baby... We've gone, you know, multiple weeks without discussing the baby's name. Um, I don't think we have a set name yeah. for sure. I'm, I haven't decided for sure, but <laughs> I'm much more open this time around, and I'm not holding on to my expectations. I, yeah, I don't. I don't have any like. It has to be this name. Yeah, but I mean, at the end of the day, after every birth, he's always like, whatever you want. Because after he watches me go through labor, he's like, you can decide. So I feel pretty confident that we already have names, but. Well, I guess we'll decide when the baby's born. But we, we do have names that are like our favorites kind of picked out. Do you ever resent Andrew for his free time and how you give him the attention he needs? So these are kind of two different questions. I think there's kind of a misconception that Andrew has a lot of free time because he definitely doesn't. I do most of our online social media work, but he does so much work within the family. I think we have pretty equal amounts of free time which is quite small, but we still make sure to make sh make sure we get the, that free time. But he handles the garden, which is an extreme amount of work because of our goals of wanting to grow a lot of our own food. It takes a lot of time and effort to grow your own food. It's really not like a simple, just like, oh, toss some seeds in the ground and watch everything sprout up. So it's a lot of work that is like, could be considered an almost full-time job in and of itself. And then he also watches the kids and homeschools the kids a lot while I'm working. And then he answers the emails for our work every single night after the kids go to bed. So we both have a similar amount of work that we do throughout our day, it's just different types of work. Oh, and then the last thing, how do you give him the attention he needs? <laughs> do you feel like you need a lot of attention? No, I mean, I need, everybody needs. <laughs> yeah needs attention, but yeah, yeah. I'm, not a, I'm not a needy person. Well, you're not a needy person, but you do value quality time over. Yes. That is one of your like stronger love languages. So our way of making sure we get that quality time together and he gets the attention he needs and vice versa. <laughs> sounds funny you say that about you because you're just like not that type of person. After the kids go to bed, after he finishes emails, we have like a routine. We're very like routine, plan oriented people. So kids go to bed around 7.45 or 8. He answers emails for 45 minutes. And then we spend like about an hour together either listening to an audiobook or watching a show or watching a movie, cuddling on the couch, having talks, and going to bed together. So that's like our time alone together. And then sometimes we get a date night once the blue moon, like by switching off with having our friends watching the kids so that we can get some alone time. So that's nice when we get to do that. How do you plan everything without knowing the gender? I'm a planner, so that seems stressful. Neither of us really care if it's a boy or a girl and it wouldn't really affect anything that we do anyways so even if we knew it was going to be a boy or a girl i don't think it would change yeah maybe a couple extra dresses that you <laughs> might pick up at the thrift shop or something yeah yeah but overall, but overall it's like it's, the same it's not like it's not like we're going to paint the room pink or paint the room yeah. blue if it's you know nothing. Oh, we don't we don't even have a baby room like with any of our kids we've never had like a baby room so baby has always slept with us in our room for the first like pretty much year of life so it wouldn't change anything whether it's a boy for, or girl for us because basically the only thing that people have to plan in advance is boy or girl colors if that's a thing for them but it's just not a thing for us how do you actively practice gentle parenting with so many children? One of the ways that we've been working on this recently is listening to an audiobook by Dr. Laura Markham uh, called Peaceful Parent Happy Kids. And we've been listening to it together for about 30 minutes after the kids go to bed. To me, uh, I can't speak for him, but for me, it helps remind me how to be my best self and how to be the best parent that I can be for my kids. So like the next morning when they wake up, I'm ready to go, I'm feeling refreshed. It's just easier for me to get in that mindset of being understanding and kind and respectful through all situations and circumstances and to apologize when I do make mistakes. And then other factors that are super helpful and important is getting to bed early, making sure we're 
giving each other enough alone time apart from the kids. Like I'll watch the kids so he can work out every morning because that's really important to him to get his workout time so that when he gets back, he's feeling rejuvenated. He's got that time to take care of himself. And then for me, when I want to work out or have some girl time, he'll watch the kids. And that, I think that's really helpful. If we didn't have any of that, I think we'd be way more stressed and having a harder time being calm. Yeah, you had mentioned earlier about routine. Not everybody likes to do a routine, but children tend to thrive better. Not all children, but a lot of children tend to thrive with routines each day. That kind of helps the kids stay grounded and know where we're going. And obviously there's, there's difficult days that are harder than others and we all make our share of mistakes. But yeah, being reminded with the books and talking about it with Ellen is also a helpful reminder because if you're not complete, constantly reminding yourself of why you're trying to do it, you're you're gonna have a hard time probably sticking with it yeah. when you're not feeling your best or when the kids are not feeling their best either. Yeah, and also something else that's really helpful is if I feel myself at like a breaking point, like I'm starting to lose it and lose my cool, but Andrew is around, I'll ask Andrew to step in and help me in a situation when I feel like I won't be able to handle it my best and that is helpful too, mm -hmm. just to be able to be like, hey, can you take over right now? I'm gonna need a break, I need a moment, you know? And if you're um, a stay-at-home mom or if you're a stay-at-home parent and your partner is at work, having conversations about when can you take over when you get home from work after you've had time to rejuvenate from your day at work um, so that I can get some alone time. Just like getting a routine set in so that we can all be taking care of each other um, just can make it easier to handle situations better. And if you don't have a partner and you're a single parent, like don't be afraid to ask for help from a loved one, a family member, or friends, and try to get some time where you guys can exchange babysitting. Um, I've talked about this in previous videos, but I think that can be really helpful. What color hair do you think this baby will have? I love how all three of your kids have different hair colors. I think it's gonna be brown this time. <laughs> Just because I have brown hair, and all my siblings have brown hair, my dad has brown hair, so you someone's gotta have brown, brown hair, You right? hair when he was a like baby. Oh my gosh, your baby photos. We haven't had any true brown-haired oh. kids yet. <laughs> so Elvis has like dirty blonde hair, and Sandy has bright blonde hair, and then Scout has like a strawberry blonde red hair. So yeah. that would be crazy if we had like a brown-haired kid. I feel like with each baby, as I said, if I had to guess, it's going to be brown, but I've been wrong all three times. So. <laughs> Actually, if I really had to guess, I'd probably guess the next baby would be like Elvis's color. Like a dirty blonde. Dirty blonde, yeah. yeah. Ellen will use a doula this time. I've had a doula for every single birth, but I, I don't think it's necessarily necessary when you have a partner that's very supportive for you. It just depends on your situation. But having a birth assistant and a doula um, with your midwife, that's just how I've had for all of my births. And I'm having the same doula I had at my last birth. Her name is Haley. And I'll leave a link below to her Instagram page if you want to check her services out. If you live on Maui and you're looking for doula services, she is wonderful. So yeah, I'll put that link below. All right, so that's it. What do you think, Ange? Oh, we got through a lot of questions. There were so many. I hope we covered the main ones that were asked the most. I tried to do the ones that were more, most common. But yeah, this is a really fun video. I think we should do this more often. That sounds great. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks for joining, and we'll see you next video.